the shrill, demented choirs of wailing shells, and bugles calling for them from such shires. What candles may be held to speed them all? Not in the hands of boys, but in their eyes shall shine the holy glimmer of goodbyes. Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. And as you can probably tell by the uh, the little Royal Oak <laughs> model there, uh, harbored completely out of scale, but harbored there in the Delaware of Philadelphia, <laughs> um, we are looking at the Royal Oak. So this is the Royal Oak 15450. It's the 37 millimeter version. Of course, before I get into it, I'll do a quick wristwatch check. I'm wearing the uh, the Cosmonaut or the Cosy, as I've started calling it. I should call it Cosmo, really, I guess, or perhaps the Scott Carpenter. But um, yeah, Cosy is just so quick and simple. My usual thing of putting Y's on the end of everything. Don't know why. Flighty, Subby, uh, <laughs> Cosy. There we <laughs> there we go. Anyway, let's get into it. You can probably tell I'm quite excited. Um, I've had this for over a week now, so I've really got to know this watch, really enjoyed it. Uh, this particular version was introduced at SIHH in 2012, uh, along with its bigger brother, the uh, 41mm version, that is the uh, 15400. But this is the mid-size version, and very much, in my opinion, is the closer to the truest um, current incarnation of the very first Royal Oak that changed the world back in 1972, which was of course 39 millimeters. First, a little bit of history. Uh, the Royal Oak was a groundbreaking watch that has subsequently become a certified icon. Uh, this was because it was the world's first Hort Horology sports watch in steel. And this very much ushered in a whole new era of high-end luxury watchmaking. Designed by, at the time, and not so well known, I mean, he had already established himself great success with the Universal Genève, which I've, I've covered extensively and talked about, I've owned as well. Um, but he was soon to become very famous, and we are, of course, talking about legendary Swiss designer, Gerald Genta. So the name Royal Oak derives from the historical tree in England where King Charles II hid from Cromwell's parliamentary forces in 1651. And in honor of this tree that saved the king's life, it would go on to become a powerful symbol of, of Britishness. The oak, after all, uh, was also the material that was used predominantly to build the ships and fleets that would go on to explore, trade, and uh, ultimately create empire. And so over time, eight naval ships of the Royal Navy would proudly carry the name and that number in turn would inspire Genta um, with his implementation of the octagonal bezel, eight octagonal bezel, etc. And that is why we see this distinctive also porthole naval kind of look. Additionally, Adamar Piguet really loved the name because of its royal prestige, perfectly fitting a watch that has naturally become a something of a status symbol in its own right. But to me, this has got to be the most tasteful and classic version. Unlike the later blinged out precious metal and frosted variants, this is a, a very restrained elegance. This case and bracelet has to be one of the most beautifully polished steel creations in the watch world, packed full of contrasting angular edges, smooth curves, subtle lines where vertical brushing meets mirror finish with razor sharp accuracy. The bracelet has a graceful taper to it. Um, it's definitely one of the, my most favorite features. Uh, I, it looks great on the straps, don't get me wrong, but there's a magic that, that you get 
Um, I mean, look at it. So yeah, it's wonderfully articulated as a, as a perfectly balanced and reassuring center links. Uh, these links, just like the edges of the case, have an enticing high polish beveling, that kind of twinkle in the light um, ever so slightly uh, in comparison to the predominantly um, brushed look of the watch. This outstanding finishing is not only just to look more elegant, but it makes the tactile experience of handling this watch more refined. There's no sharp edges that make it feel rough or crude in any way whatsoever. So it has a, a double purpose there, very, very clever. The bracelet is fastened using an excellent double push button deployment there. The action to it is just Amazing, it's signed obviously there, but you see little details like the um, bead blasted finishing on the AP sign and even on the inside. Look how solid it is as well. Uh, very substantial indeed. I mean, this is not easy to achieve, this level of mastery in, in, in polishing and uh, this has taken AP a long time. I mean, nobody does steal like AP uh, and you, that experience and decades, decades of know-how has, has certainly paid off. You feel it, you see it. So we really should talk about the main event here, and that is, of course, that grand tapisserie dial. Uh, unlike the 70s original, this time we see it in crisp silver. It almost looks like kind of ice white in certain lights, um, even more pronounced than its blue and gray counterparts. It certainly plays with the light um, and accentuates the way the light hits it even more, in my opinion. So this very intricate dial gets this three-dimensional guilloche pattern and is made using techniques centuries old. The engine turned process is highly complex and it requires the skills of a specially trained craftsman. Um, something you don't actually learn in any kind of uh, watchmaking schools. This is passed down actually from generation to generation within AP and it's something that AP absolutely specialize in and you can <laughs> i mean you can tell uh, it's definitely one of the most definitive features of the uh, the royal oak so the result is something utterly unique bewitching and and is displayed under a flat glare proofed sapphire glass there you see Adomar piguet is signed printed on a little flat section as is automatic very cool indeed but you'll see the patterns of the guilloche continues the ring that uh, frames the dial at the, right at the periphery there, you see in a high polish, gives a wonderful watery effect. It reflects the dial and gives it extra depth, fitting with the nautical theme of the watch. Absolutely adore that. The dial is then finished off with uh, a white gold applied AP logo and we have multifaceted batten hour markers with a decent luminescence. I was quite surprised at this and it gives a very clear orientation in low light using a double marker at the 12 o'clock and a very slight cut off one at the three to make way for that beautifully placed date. I, I have to say, you see where it cuts off? It's where other markers would cut off. It's not intrusive and, and still somehow remains very, very balanced. And the date is manipulated using a screw down crown at the three o'clock as well. The screw down enables the water resistance to be 50 meters. And if you notice, it's in a hexagonal shape as well, uh, matching the hexagonal screws on the bezel. Again, we, this little nod to kind of the ship design, uh, you know, the bolts you would have, and rivets you would have seen on, on, a, um, on, a, on a, a battleship, of course. If we unscrew it, it's, it's got quite a good action to it. It's very solid feeling, quite ergonomic, in, interestingly. So not just looks cool, um, it's quite, you know, it's easy to, to grip. So inside, if we turn it over, we'll see another marvel of engineering. Uh, and that is the in-house caliber 3120, originally built for AP sports models. This movement is considerably tougher than those found in the watch's predecessors. The extra large free sprung balance there is increased to give more uh, resistance to shock and performance deviation. Uh, this is due to the greater inertia obviously and is assisted in stability by the full balance bridge we see there. This extra large balance also uh, enables it to be adjusted 
uh, or adjustable to a greater level of precision. And if you see the rotor turning there, it's, uh, where it connects, we have ceramic ball bearings uh, that are highly efficient and they reduce the wobble of the bi-directional winding considerably. In fact, they need virtually no maintenance over time. Uh, it is also richly decorated. We have machined pelage work, uh, uh, Cote de Genève striping, uh, high polished beveling, inverted snailing on the bridges, intricate hand engraving that you'd come to expect on horology on the rotor there, the coat of arms of the AP family. And this is all displayed beautifully by this sapphire case back for you to really enjoy uh, the, the, the movement again with this porthole. Uh, style. Most notably, uh, to, to match the um, some of the wheels and balance, the rotor is in a solid 22 karat yellow gold, and this is to kind of differentiate its presence. And I, I really like that touch, this kind of two-tone theme that's running throughout the back, and it kind of highlights the moving components of the watch. Very, very cool. A subtle but lovely little detail. There are actually, talking of components, 280 of them. It's a 40 joule movement. Uh, it has the ability, if we unscrew the crown, uh, you'll see, if I pull it out all the way, it is, of course, hackable. If we go to the first position, we got manual wind, which is incredibly buttery smooth and, and, and refined feeling. Uh, the quick set date, obviously there and it has a healthy power reserve as I screw down the crown of 60 hours and operates at a slightly slower speed of 21,600 vibrations an hour which enables it to have obviously less wear and tear on the moving parts and um, boosts its uh, accuracy and longevity. The movement also if we look at the profile enables the watch to be very very thin it's a staggering 9.9. .9. Actually, let's get the proper dimensions out of the way. Yeah, it's 9.6 millimeters tall. Lug to lug, 46.6. Yeah, 37. Yeah, it is bang on 37. And it's flush as well. So it's, it's you know, it's a precise 37 millimeters. Just a wonderful size. Uh, it's also worthy to note, it does wear, actually, let's pop it on the wrist so I can show you how it actually wears. And I've Oh, I've been enjoying this so much. On my six and a quarter inch wrist, it, it's extremely comfortable. The links are also screwed links. It fits the contour of your wrist masterfully, once correctly adjusted. It wears a little bit larger because this does protrude, but it angles the bracelet in the correct position. Just very, very, actually I fitted this to my other wrist, which is a little bit skinnier, so it's quite tight here. Yeah, so it has a very surprising weight of only 130 grams, which for something so, you know, steel dependent is quite light. But I have to say it is incredibly comfy, very solid and reassuring feeling and, and remarkably slender as well. So what about the positives and negatives? Well, we'll start with the positives. Uh, firstly, it's a true icon, strong heritage, beautifully and profoundly detailed and alluring design. I love the, uh, the link to British history in the name. I certainly appreciate that more. Uh, the feeling of luxury, it's, it's unequivocally there. It's mesmerizing to look at. I, you know, it's one of those watches you look at and you just forget that you wanted to know what the time is and you start staring at it. I also like the fact that it's unlike anything out there. Well, yes, nowadays it's been mimicked to death, but this is the original. So. I like that. Also, I have to say the 37 millimeter size, actually all the proportions are just perfection. Uh, if you have the larger wrist, there's the 41 millimeter version. So, you know, there's that option there for you too. There's also quite strong value retention. I remember when I looked into buying one of these myself, there was even a, a waiting list. Um, so the demand is higher than supply and, and AP are, are, are quite good. Obviously not Rolex good at value retention, but who is? Uh, <laughs> But yeah, it's it's fairly strong, um, definitely. The performance, accuracy, it's all there. Absolutely delivers. Um, you know, I'm I'm getting within cost. It's never, you know, deviation here was not even a few seconds. Negatives, well, there's no micro adjustment. Once fitted, that's it. Uh, it would have been nice to see some kind of um, ability to to change this. You know, I I don't know how they'd incorporate a like a, 
some kind of glide lock system-esque thing in there, that would have been really cool. A small price to pay for such an amazing bracelet. It does tend to be a scratch magnet. That's one complaint, especially the bezel here. It's one of those watches that looks, well, in my opinion, better new. I, I think a Submariner looks better banged up, as does a, a, a Seamaster or something like, along those lines. But this looks better, you know, polished and, in my opinion, that's, I guess that's just personal taste. Also the high price, this is, it's a double-edged sword. You know, I'd love to buy this. If I wasn't so ruddy broke, uh, I'd, I, I'd snap this up in a second. Although I think the price is justified. My only last negative really is the low water resistance. I would have preferred 100 meters with the screw down crown. I think with 100 meters, it would have made it the absolute, you know, it would be neck and neck with the uh, the day date. I mean, that is something that we all deeply appreciate and admire about the, the famous Oyster case. You know, there's nothing like Rolex's Oyster case. This particular version in the uh, watch box inventory, uh, just a quick note, you'll see that how the bolts on the, on the bezel are still kind of sunken. It's a good sign that it hasn't been over polished since it left the factory. So a little telltale sign there. If, if, if the screws are flush with the case, then it has been polished. But this one has never been polished outside the factory. So very cool indeed. So in conclusion, while there are more, well, certainly more ostentatious versions, but not just with more bling, you know, we see the, the some with serious horological muscle inside, like the open work, which I've discussed before, I utterly adore, but this version is a little bit more understated while still managing to evoke that luxurious feeling to the wearer. For a watch to achieve this without overcompensating in exaggerated size or flashiness, I think is a testament to the everlasting strength of the Royal Oak design. It still feels refreshing, futuristic, and as they say when it first debuted, avant-garde. It definitely hasn't dated, which I think many decades later is, is an incredible achievement. On the contrary, it's proven itself as a timeless classic. So it's just as compelling now as it is, or as it was. So why do I consider this the perfect luxury watch? Well, to me, the, the Rolex Submariner certainly is a contender and very much is a, is a rival here. But let's not forget that started its life as a tool watch, whereas the Royal Oak was intended as a luxury watch from the very start. One of the signs of a great design in a watch is versatility and the, the ability to wear it, not only with different attire, but also in differing situations. I think the Rolex Day Date is perhaps the closest rival to this in regards to ticking the same kind of boxes. And I've discussed that at great length with my own Day Date. The Royal Oak, especially in this configuration, looks great suited and booted going to a formal event um, you know I'd, I'd love to wear this at the opera for example but it looks just as good lounging about in a tracksuit at home unlike the blue dial which don't get me wrong is absolutely gorgeous uh, i think along with the gray the gray is certainly more compatible but it's the silver that i think has the most compatibility and and will never clash with any attire. It blends the refinement of under the cuff slenderness of a dress watch with the robust boldness of a sports watch uh, more than any other watch I know or can think of out there. What Genta set out to achieve, he absolutely nailed it with this. And I think this is why, you know, it was before the Nautilus, it was before all these kind of, um, I'm not saying he, in a way, he kind of copied. It's the same design again that we see, but in different style. I, I, this was the, the original, you know, and that's very, very important. This watch has the perfect marriage of traditional high-end watchmaking techniques, contemporary micro-engineering, practical and functional design, and cutting-edge materials. It works seamlessly all together in this, uh, in a revolutionary watch that is unmistakably of, of true horterology quality. I think it's also important to understand that AP is still independent. They have a very rich and long heritage. AP is actually the largest and oldest Swiss watch brand still to be in the hands of the founding family, uh, going back since 1875, which is almost unheard of these days. You, you, you just don't see that. 
and it's something to be deeply proud of. And I've also talked about this many times with my own AP, the little moon phase I have. Not only that, you look at the Wikipedia page, you see all the firsts, the achievements, and the horological innovation AP have brought to the table over the centuries, and you see why it's held in such high regard and considered, you know, part of the holy trinity of watchmakers. I think people tend to overlook AP because of, you know, the louder offshores, these big over-the-top watches. It's no accident that in 2012, when they released this model, they simultaneously introduced the new brand slogan, to break the rules, you must first master them. This is exactly what this watch embodies to the absolute core. I love how they've hand engraved the family heraldry on the back uh, to remind us of this astonishing legacy with every line, carefully considered curve, and exquisitely proportioned surface, I think of how Genta must have spent uh, so much time deliberating these devilish little details. And we mustn't forget that AP took a massive risk back in the early 70s. We don't blink twice at uh, super luxury sports watches these days, but in 1972, this was groundbreaking, and you have to give them the respect to uh, the willingness to invest in such an innovative and, and daring idea. It obviously has paid off handsomely, so, uh, so well in fact, the Royal Oak has undoubtedly kept AP at the top. The Royal Oak, without a shadow of a doubt, for me, is absolute pure class, and I think forever will be. Um, yeah, I'm going to leave it there. Amazing watch. <laughs> I'm sad to see it go back to Watchbox, but yeah, uh, a worthy grail watch, certainly. So anyway, guys, let me know your thoughts, queries, comments, opinions, all the rest of it down below, especially if you own a Royal Oak. Love to hear what you love about it, what you don't love about it so much. Um, yeah, please do share that. Anyway, guys, don't forget, please, to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful. And as always, guys, thank you so much for watching, and I will catch you in the next one. Okay, ciao. Now, before I go, guys, I just want to quickly tell you about this extremely cool app that Watchbox have launched. This is my own personal go-to app for everything watch-related. Using the app, you can keep track of the real-time value of your watch collection. You can store watches in your digital watch box and even try on watches using an augmented reality. So don't miss out and please go to the App Store and download it today. You can access all of my latest videos right there in the app itself. And if you haven't already, please follow me on the official Urban Gentry Instagram and of course the Facebook UGWC. But most importantly of all, keep it positive, onwards and upwards.